the silence we long to hear the sound of death without sting a trumpet of hope to pierce through despair and ring in an era of From sin no more For flesh without mark From Adam's stain Bearing no trace of the ancient war Oh, how long Will we wait Broken Until the day comes when all is new, our labor is not in vain. Immovable saints, steady and true, abound in his work till death is slain. Oh. to endless life. Well, good morning and welcome to Life Point Church. Let's stand as we worship this morning.
How could I have known you were better? Thank you for the lonely times When I learned to live in the silence As the other voices fade I can hear you calling It's worth it all just to know you more. You've done great things, Jesus. Your love never fails me. My soul will sing. You have done great things. Before the scars. worth it all just to know How are we doing? Good. What I want you to do before you have a seat, I want you to turn around, tell somebody good morning, and that they look good, and you have a seat. Good morning. You doing all right? Good, good, good. And as you uh, listen, as you're sitting down, we still have people coming in. So if you'll kind of squeeze, if you have any seats in between, you kind of squeeze in so that we can have people come in and sit, sit in the sides. But welcome to Life Point Church. Uh, it is good to see you this morning. My name's Blake. I'm one of the pastors here. And um, 
If you're new here, if this is your first time, if we did not catch you on the way in, we'd love to talk to you on the way out. We have a Connect Center. As soon as you walk out these double doors to the left, we'll have some volunteers and some staff over there. And so we would love, love, love to talk to you a little bit and uh, just see where you are in life, where you're from, just get to know you a little bit. Um, Lots going on uh, right now here around the church. I have just a few announcements for you. If you have lost someone recently, if you um, are, are, are experiencing any type of grief, we have a, a program called Grief Share. It's an incredible program. It's 13 weeks. It's going to start on May the 7th. That's a Thursday night. It's going to be every Thursday night. And, um, and man, Frank uh, does a great job leading that. And so if, if, if you're interested in that, uh, you can sign up. All these signups are on the, on the app. Uh, which will be if on the back of the seats. You can scan the QR code there, and uh, it should bring up all the announcements and everything you can sign up for on there. So we'd love for you to do that. Also, if you're a grad, if you're going to graduate from high school or college this year, um, we need to know because we want to honor you on a- April the 28th after the 1045 service. We're going to have a, a, a meal for you, and we're going to honor you that day. So we need to know how many to expect. And so we'd love for you to sign up for that as well. And also on Mother's Day, we are having baby dedication. Uh, so we do that every year on Mother's Day. And so uh, we need you to sign up for that. Contact us. And we have a video that we make with all the parents. And it's just a really awesome time celebrating with our, celebrating all of our, our newborns. And so uh, let us know uh, if, if that pertains to you. Uh, excited about today. Um, man, what a, what a beautiful day, yeah? Yeah, outside is just gorgeous. It's Master Sunday which makes it all the better, right? Uh, so yeah, uh, everybody's like, Blake, shut up. Let's go home so we can watch the master stuff. Uh, but we're excited about what God's gonna do today. And so I'm gonna open some prayer and, uh, and we'll, we'll go back to worshiping through songs. Lord, we love you. And we thank you for, oh man, thank you for your generosity and your grace to us. That we could come here on a beautiful day like this, a beautiful place like this, with beautiful people like this, and uh, just worship you. A lot of places in the world that can't do that. A lot of places in the world in turmoil right now. Lord, we pray for Israel and what happened overnight there in Israel. And Lord, we're commanded in the Bible to continue to pray for Israel. And so we do that, Lord, we do that today. We pray that your hand of mercy and grace will, and peace will touch that part of the, that part of the world. Lord, and that ultimately you'll be glorified through whatever happens over there. We know the conflict's not going away. Lord, we pray for peace in the meantime and protection for people there. Lord, I pray for us here now as we worship through song, as we study your word. Lord, I pray that you would give us eyes to see, that you would give us ears to hear. Lord, if there's something we need to repent of this morning, Lord, convict us of that. If there's something we need to, to be grateful for this morning, Lord, teach us that. Lord, we just pray that you will teach us through your word. And teach us as we worship. Lord, we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's stand and continue to worship.
You know, church, each week we have this opportunity, this time that we can praise. And that might look different for each one of us. But in this moment, I just pray that our eyes would be on the Father this morning and that we would worship Him in this time. He's done so much for us, and we're so undeserving, but we're thankful for His grace and His mercy. So let's keep singing.
pray together, church. God, there is no other name except for yours. This morning, this is our anthem. We are declaring all our praise, all our worship belongs to you. You sent your son, Jesus, and he overcame death. He overcame sin. And all we can do this morning is praise you. God, I pray that this worship this morning is pleasing to you. This is our offering to you. We love you. In your name, amen. Well, good morning again. If you have your Bible, turn with me to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. And uh, we are quickly coming to an end of our series in the book of Hebrews. Um, hopefully, you have enjoyed it. Hopefully, you've gotten a lot out of our study of this book. I hope you've been challenged by it. And if you, if you haven't, uh, I, think, I think we're going to be today. Um, we've said this a couple of times already in this series, that the Bible... It's not always, instru- always simply instructional, all right? And what I mean by that is that the Bible isn't always just about telling us what to do and how to act and who to be, all right? I know we want to read it like that, right? We want to read the Bible and say, hey, tell me, teach me how to live, teach me who to be. A lot of times, there are huge chunks of Scripture attributed to how we think, to changing how we think, changing our perspective on things, because what God knows that if we can, He can change how we think, then it changes also how we live and what we do. So last week we talked about sports analogies in the Bible, in particular uh, running a race, that uh, the Christian life is a lot like running a race and not a short race, right? Not like a sprint. You can control a lot of the variables in a sprint because it's so short. But when you run a long race, there are lots of variables that you can't necessarily control, like a marathon. Who in here has ever run a marathon? Anybody? Nobody? I had a few people that have, okay, all right, see, okay, you're just being bashful, that's fine. Um, but a marathon can be hard, and there are lots of unexpected challenges that pop up when they run a long race like that. Let me give you an example. Um, my wife decided whenever uh, we had first gotten married, I mean, we were newlyweds, she said, she, her and her dad decided that they were going to walk a marathon. They were thinking, I mean, it's just walking, right? Surely you can just walk 26 miles. It's no big deal. It's just walking. So they decided they were going to walk a marathon. Well, my, my, my wife's dad always walked in Tevas. Everybody know what Tevas are? I always walked in Tevas. That was his workout outfit. It was a short sleeve button-up shirt, uh, khaki shorts, and Tevas. And so but he decided for this race, he was going to buy tennis shoes. Problem is, he didn't break them in. And so they... They, they planned a race. It was down at the beach. They went down to the beach. He start, they start to walk. They get about halfway through the race, right at the, at the halfway mark. And he had had blisters that had welled up on his feet, blood blisters that were so big that they popped and there was just blood everywhere. It was gross. And he had to quit. Like he, he could not keep going. Well, Rise was like, well, we're here. Might as well finish it. And so she takes off and she's going to do the last half by herself. And now, you had, in order to get a medal, which she wanted, you had to walk it, you had to finish walking it in less than eight hours. And so we came back to the finish line to watch her finish. And so there was a guy with a walkie-talkie that was talking to somebody on, the, on the, the, the route called the sweeper. Now, if you don't know what a sweeper is, the sweeper is the last person in the race. He has to finish the race last to make sure everybody else is off of the, the course. And so we find out that he, he's saying that Roz is going to make it. Like, she's gonna, probably going to finish in in eight hours. So we get to the finish line and I'm thinking, man, I'm going to go and I'm going to walk the last little bit with her. So I start down the path a little bit. And, and as I'm walking, I see through the woods going down this road, emergency vehicles, like ambulances and fire trucks and a, a big truck with a, with a flatbed on the on a trailer on the back of it. And I'm thinking, what in the world? I mean, it's a convoy of emergency vehicles just barely creeping down the road. And I look a little closer, and as she comes around, Roz is walking around the corner, all of these emergency vehicles. She's the last one in the race. They're all slowly at three miles per hour following right behind her. She's the last one. 
And they're actually getting the cones and putting them on the flatbed truck behind her. So she comes around the corner and I'm like, I'm trying to be encouraged. I'm like, good job, baby. That way to go. She has tears streaming down her face. She couldn't hardly feel her legs. She couldn't bend her knees at all. Couldn't hardly feel her legs. She had blisters in between her toes. I've never seen blisters in between somebody's toes, but she had blisters in between her toes. That's because in a race that long, you may think it's easy. You may think it's just going to be a breeze, but there are unexpected challenges that come up because of that. And there's going to be pain and there's going to be hardship that you have to persevere through if you're going to, if you're going to finish the race and finish it well. And the Christian life is a lot like a marathon. There's going to be hardship. There's going to be pain. There's going to be suffering. And how we go in, what we understand and how we respond to these challenges will depend on how well we run and how well we finish. And that's going to be important. As the writer of Hebrews is encouraging the people that are reading this book, Which I I remind you that the original readers of this book, the plight of the people reading this letter, these these are Jews that have now said they believed in Jesus and they're following Christ. And so what the writer is doing as they suffer more and more persecution for what they believe, he is encouraging them to hold fast. Listen, there's gonna be unexpected challenges. Hold fast. Don't fall away. There's going to be things that are hard that you're going to have to push through. Don't fall away. Because when we do, it makes it easier to quit. And so we're going to start by reading the first three verses uh, of chapter 12. We actually read these verses, studied these verses last week. We're going to read them again because we're going to build on those today. Here, we're going to start the second part of verse 1. It says this. It says, let us run with endurance the race that lies before us, keeping our eyes on Jesus the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy that lay before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, so that you, so here's why we should do this, so that you won't grow weary and give up. The final, this was the final point of last week. The final point of last week was, you need to fix your eyes on Jesus, you need to focus on Jesus, And you might say, why? It becomes all the more apparent when we look at verse four. Look at verse four, it says this. It says, in struggling against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood. What's he talking about here? He's saying that we need to fix our eyes on Jesus because there's gonna come times that we're in this life, we're gonna struggle against sin. Now, I think that means a couple of things. Number one, I think it means that there's gonna be an internal struggle to resist temptation and sin. I think that's the one we all think about when we think about struggling with sin. The other thing I think it's talking about here is enduring the results of sin in this world. Enduring the results of sin in this world. Because pain and suffering are a result of sin and rebellion. And we see that in this world. We we live in a fallen, broken world. And sickness and pain, all of this is a result of, of a sinful world. And so he tells us, That when we live in a world like this, we have to remember Jesus. Because Jesus walked through his suffering, not only resisting temptation, but also bearing the result of our sin on himself. And he endured it with humility and endurance and faithfulness. And so remembering is important because if we haven't seen somebody else walk through it, we might think it's impossible for us to walk through it. If we don't remember that Jesus suffered... And if we don't remember how Jesus dealt with that suffering, how did Jesus deal with his suffering? He dealt with his suffering um, with with courage. He dealt with his suffering um, and stayed faithful and he persevered. And if we don't remember that, then we may decide that it's impossible, not worth it. We may decide that it's unreasonable. The pain is unreasonable. And we may grow weary in our suffering and fall away. And so what is God's specific instruction when it comes to our struggles and suffering? What the writer's about to do is he's going to begin to quote a a, a verse in the book of Psalms. Psalm chapter 3, verse 11 and 12. And I want you to pay close attention to the connection that he makes here. He describes our suffering in a very, very specific way. And this is not easy for, for believers to read. Here's what it says. 
And you have forgotten the exhortation that, that addresses you as sons. He's saying, you're not thinking right because you've forgotten God's word. You've forgotten his commands. This is what it says next. It says, my son, do not take the Lord's discipline lightly or lose heart when you're reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the ones he loves and punishes every son he receives. Did you catch that? He equates a believer's hardship and pain and suffering with what? With discipline. So here's what this means for us. Here's what it means for us as believers living in, in this world. It means that for the believer, all hardship, all pain, and all suffering is God's discipline. Now, that brings up some really tough questions, yeah? Some of you may be thinking, so are you telling me that my spouse is sick? That my child is ill? That my father has cancer because of God? Like, is that God's discipline? Like, did God give me cancer to discipline me? Was, was my wife's miscarriage God's fault? Or maybe even worse, was it, was it her fault? And God's disciplining her for something? Is my, is my grandfather's dementia and the fact that he doesn't know who's who right now, is that God's fault? Is that God disciplining him? Or is it God disciplining someone around him? Like this brings up some serious, serious theological and really even ethical questions, yeah? And so here's what I wanna do. I wanna, first of all, I wanna give you two things, two things that may clear this up because some of you, that stroke an emotional chord. You may quit listening right now, like you're in the fog of confusion. And so in order to clear that fog a little bit, to allow us to, to take what God's word is gonna say about sufferings, in order for us to do that, I wanna clear up maybe just a couple of things and I'm not gonna answer all of your questions. In fact, you're probably gonna have more questions than you do have answers at the end of the sermon. But that's what God's people are for, Yeah. We can read the Bible together and we can search through even hard questions together. Sometimes they don't even make sense. And so let me give you two things that I think might clear some of it up, but not all of it up. Here's the first thing, is that we need to remember that all suffering and hardship in this life are ultimately caused by rebellion and sin. And whose fault is rebellion and sin? Not God's fault. Like rebellion and sin, that's our fault. In fact, the fact that God hasn't already gone scorched earth on everything and everyone is a testament to his patience and his mercy, isn't it? The fact that God hasn't already destroyed it all because of sin is a testament to his patience. And so I believe that God, God uses the results of sin. I don't think God causes it. I don't think God calls cancer. I don't think he causes pain. I think he allows it because in this world, in a world where we're all gonna suffer, we're all gonna experience pain, the, the good and the bad alike. God now uses that pain to teach us something. So suffering is not his fault, it's ultimately our fault. So God, God uses, not causes our suffering. The second thing I want you to know is that there's a difference between punishment and discipline. There's a difference between wrath and discipline, isn't there? We're told conclusively in God's word that God brings wrath on his enemies but he brings discipline to the ones he loves. He brings discipline to his children. That's what the verse just told us, that he disciplines those who he loves. Now, here's the problem. Those two things are hard to tell apart. The way wrath feels and the way discipline feels, sometimes it feels the same, doesn't it? It's a lot like um, if a murderer had a knife and he goes to murder somebody and he stabs them, it is metal going through somebody. Like if they were to stab you, it's gonna feel a certain way. But you know what it feels a lot like? It feels a lot like a surgeon who takes a surgeon's scalpel and stabs you. Both of them feel the same. But the murderer stabs out of wrath, out of anger, in order to kill someone. A surgeon takes a surgeon's scalpel and he'll cut into you in order to cut something out of you for your good, to make you whole, to make you healthy again. And this is the difference between God's wrath and God's discipline. Let me remind you that God has already taken out his wrath on the believer, right? If you're a believer in here, your sins, God's wrath on your sin has been punished on the cross and you will never experience the wrath of God for your sin. 
But our sufferings, the things we go through, we have to see as God's discipline. And this is the change in perspective I'm talking about. This is the change in thinking that I'm talking about because they feel the same. Wrath and discipline feel the same, but there's a different purpose for them. God's purpose in your discipline is to cut something out of you that needs to be cut out of you in order for you to be made whole and to be more like him. God only cares out wrath on the non-believer. And that can be a hard distinction to make. Like, like we have to begin to see God's discipline on us as his grace. And you say, but how can that be? Look at what it says next, verse seven. Endure sufferings as discipline. It's teaching us how to think. Endure suffering as discipline. God is dealing with you as sons. For what son is there that a father does not discipline? But if you're without discipline, which all receive, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. So he's saying that if you aren't being disciplined, then that means that you're not sons, which inversely means that if we are being disciplined, then it's proof that we are God's children. That suffering as, uh, suffering as a Christian is actually proof of our sonship. And that's a hard distinction to make, a hard distinction for us to understand, but it's actually what the writer of Hebrews is telling us, that there are a couple of purposes that God has in discipline. The first one is this, is that there is a fatherly purpose to discipline. He is treating us as sons. He asked a rhetorical question. What kind of father does not discipline their children? And the answer to that question is no father at all. The ancient world knew nothing of a father not disciplining their child. In fact, I would suggest that in 2024, if a father does not discipline their children, then he does not love his children. And this isn't just my opinion, it's what the Bible teaches. In fact, the Bible teaches it in more harsh terms. Look at what it says, Proverbs chapter 13, verse 24. The one who will not use the rod, everybody knows what that is, right? Old timers used to call it a switch, a hickory, right? The one who will not use the rod hates his son, but the one who loves him disciplines him diligently. If you don't spare the rod, you hate your son. Now, is the rod, is spanking, what we call corporal discipline, is it the only way to discipline your children? No, it's not the only way to discipline children. In fact, in our world, it's almost taboo to do that now. You spank your kids, that's child abuse. In fact, um, my, my wife and, and one of my sons just went to a, a field trip and where uh, people from other parts of the country were there this week, and, and they're in Wisconsin, it's actually illegal to spank your children in public. What, listen, what better way to grow up a generation that does not respect authority or God's word than to teach parents to not discipline the way the Bible teaches? And am I saying spanking is the only way to do it? No, I'm not saying, listen, I'm not saying that corporal punishment is the only way to punish your children. There are several other ways to punish your children, but sometimes it is the right way to punish your children. You ever try to reason with a three-year-old? Like, seriously, like, it's okay, sweetheart, let's just work through your feelings. Like, no, spank them. <laughs> like, whoop them. Believe me, I, they, they, they need it. But we've taught, and we have a whole generation of people that thinks it's bad to spank your kids. That it's bad to do something that the Bible instructs us to do if we really love our kids. And I know that seems backwards, right? But listen, I spank my kids, I whoop my kids. <laughs> I didn't enjoy it. I didn't enjoy it all the time. <laughs> but listen, I did it because I loved them, not because I hated them. And you know what, as they grow older, you know what I did less? Because I, I disciplined them in a controlled environment where they understood that there were consequences to their actions, you know what happened less and less as they got older? I had to discipline them less and less as they got older. Why, because they... They learn. Proverbs chapter 29, verse 15 says that basically the same thing. It says, the rod of correction imparts wisdom, but a youth left to himself is a disgrace to his mother. Hmm. You see, we discipline our children so that they know the consequences of their actions in a controlled environment 
And if they ignore those consequences and keep making the same mistakes, they get the same results. And when you become an adult and you get in the real world, if you don't understand that there's, a, 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 there's, there's something to be paid, when you do something wrong, there are consequences to your actions and those consequences get more and more severe. Which points to the other point of discipline. Verse nine. Furthermore, we had fathers discipline us. We have, sorry, we had human fathers that discipline us and we respected them. What a beautiful verse that is, right? Because anybody here who's a father, you know that you've made mistakes, right? I mean, we make mistakes in discipline. I've, mis- I've made mistakes when I've tried to discipline my kids. Sometimes I was too harsh. Sometimes I wasn't harsh enough. Sometimes I was too lenient. Sometimes I showed favoritism. Sometimes I punished them and they didn't really deserve it. In fact, my mom, she's not in this uh, service, praise the Lord. Um, She was in the last service. I had to embarrass her. Um, There was one time where (laughs) I was was little, like probably eight or nine years old. And I fell asleep in church. And I got home and she wore me out. I mean, she spanked me for falling asleep in church. But what I didn't know at the time or what she knew and uh, didn't think about it during that time was that she had given me medicine because I was sick. She gave me medicine, which made me fall asleep in church. And then she spanked me for falling asleep in church. (laughs) You know what I didn't do anymore? I've never fallen asleep in church again. Like I'm like, you know, just (laughs) even if I get tired. Furthermore, we have fathers discipline us and we respected them. Shouldn't we submit even more to the fathers of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time based on what, they, what seemed good to them. But he does it for our benefit so that we can share in his holiness. So not only is there a fatherly purpose to discipline, but there's a sanctifying purpose in discipline. Listen, we don't always do it right. We try our best. Like as a parent, we're doing the best we can. We're trying to teach our kids to conform to a certain standard. And we don't always do that right. My my son Landon is 19 years old now, but when he was 18, we had a man dinner for him. Where you get a bunch of people, a bunch of men that are a part of his life and you get together and we had a dinner and they all kind of spoke encouragement into him and what they've seen in him and how much they love him. and, And at that dinner, I asked him, to forgive me, to forgive me of all the times that I messed up. In fact, as a father, I'm not sure there's anything that we crave, especially when our kids get older, not anything we crave more than the forgiveness of our children for the mistakes we've made. And I had to ask him forgiveness of times where I punished him and I did it the wrong way. But you know what? God never disciplines in an imperfect way. None of his discipline is ever made in mistake or he doesn't waste any of it. All his discipline is to make us more like him in order to sanctify us. And so if there's a fatherly uh, reason for discipline, if there's a sanctifying reason for discipline, in what types of ways does God discipline us? I think there are different ways that he uses discipline. The first way, I've got three of them. Here's what they are and I gotta hurry. He uses discipline first to correct, to correct us. This is when God allows us to feel and experience the direct result of our sin. This is kind of God taking his hand of grace off of us temporarily in order for the natural consequences of our sin to be experienced by us. This type of correction is painful. Many times it's temporary, but it's also very instructive. And probably the best Example of this is King David. King David was, King David intentionally slept with another man's wife. And because of that, because of that sin, I believe God just kind of temporarily took his hand off of David and allowed the natural consequences of that indiscretion to be felt. And we see that after that happened with David, there was a series of violent events that ensued. He had Bathsheba's husband killed The uh, son of this illegitimate union ultimately died. And this was God just allowing the result of David's sin to take its natural course. 
And God allows this to happen. Why does he allow it to happen? Ultimately, to lead David to repentance and to not make the same mistakes again. Just think about if God's grace continually insulated us from our stupidity. And we never felt the consequences of our sin because we're gonna sin here on earth. You see, ultimately, David did repent. You know what he realized? He realized that his sin wasn't just against Bathsheba and her husband, that his sin was against God. It was against the Lord first, and that sin then affected everyone else. It had a trickle-down effect to other people. And so God uses corrective discipline ultimately to draw us back to himself. Now, I want to make a distinction here that's very important. Remember, for the Christian, all of God's wrath on our sin has been poured out on Jesus. So God doesn't pour out his wrath on us even when we sin. But that does not mean that God will not, that God will always protect us from the natural consequences of sin in this world. If you sin in this world, they have consequences. And many, many times God allows those consequences to play out because he wants, us to see this, he wants us to see sin for the destructive force that it is. And he wants us to know that his way is better. And that's God's grace, church. It's God's grace that teaches us that his way is better than our way. And if he continually insulates us and does not allow us to see how destructive our way is, then he's not a good father. So he disciplines us in order to correct us. The second way he disciplines us is in order to strengthen us. This is, this is preventative discipline or maybe even preparatory discipline. This is when God allows things to happen in order to build your character. Um, I don't know if this is a true story or not, but I heard it and I thought it was kind of funny. It kind of it sounds like something I do, so I'm good with it. Um, there was a story of a, of a dad who was pitching to his son for the first time. His, his kid's little, he's like three or four years old, so he gets up and he knows how to you know, get up to the plate, so he's standing there. And the first thing that the dad does is hit his son with a ball, like throws it at him. And like, why would he do that? He did that in order to show his son in a controlled environment, right, that the ball wasn't gonna kill him. It was just hurt a little bit. And so that his son would ultimately in the future be a better hitter because have you ever seen somebody try to hit a ball well that's always scared if the ball's gonna hit him? So this is preparatory discipline. Paul is a great example of this. The Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 says this, therefore, so that I would not exalt myself, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to torment me so that I would not exalt myself. So God allowed this avenue of suffering for Paul, and it was so bad that Paul says it felt like Satan was tor tormenting me. But why? Why did he give it to him? Look at the last part of the verse. It says, so that I would not exalt myself, so that it would keep Paul from being prideful. And you would think, okay, well, Paul learned his lesson, right? He's writing about it right here. Surely Paul learned his lesson. He's gonna ask God to take it away from him. He's learned his lesson. He's been strengthened by that. And so maybe God will take it away, but that's not how these things work. In fact, look at Paul's conclusion in verse eight. Concerning this, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it would leave me. I didn't want it. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. He found through the process of his suffering that Jesus was enough, that Jesus was sufficient. And that's how God strengthens us. God strengthens us by helping us depend on him because he's strong when we're not. So we are disciplined to correct us. We are disciplined to strengthen us. And the last one is that we're disciplined in order to teach us. There's an educational component to discipline. In fact, the root word for discipline here literally means to instruct or teach as you would a child. And oftentimes that means to correct or to punish. But the ultimate end is to teach us. If you looked at kind of the holistic definition of discipline, it would be God's teaching us and instructing us through pain and suffering. And there's probably not a better example of this than Job. Job's hardships were not because he was living poorly, but rather because he was living well. And I wish we had time to go through Job, Lord, it's so long. Go, go read the book. 
But through his hardships and his interactions with God throughout that book, he learned to grow in deeper, deeper levels of relationship with God. And so God uses that discipline to teach us things that we can't learn any other way. So the correction of David, the strengthening of Paul, and the education of Job all work in order to sanctify us and to make us more of who God wants us to be. And if it is true that our Father disciplines us for our sanctification, then it should change the way we respond to him. That's why the writer quotes Proverbs to us. Look at what he says again, verse five. And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as son? My son, do not take the Lord's discipline lightly or lose heart. We are given the two things not to do when we're disciplined. The first thing we're told not to do when we're disciplined is to take it lightly. Like, don't ignore it. If you're suffering through something right now, don't ignore that. Like, don't ignore that pain. Go to the Lord and ask, what, God, what, what are you trying to teach me through this? Don't allow that discipline to be wasted. And some choose to do this. Some choose to be indifferent towards the Lord's rebuke and waste a chance to grow in the process. And so don't take discipline lightly. It also doesn't mean that we should overthink everything, right? Because sometimes we're like, oh, well, that's nothing, And sometimes we'll think, oh, we'll just kind of over-spiritualize everything, right? Like I stumped my toe and the Lord's trying to, no, you just stumped your toe. The Lord's not trying to teach you something through your stumped toe. So sometimes we take it too lightly and sometimes we overdo it. I heard somebody say this week that there's a, for every mile of road, there's two miles of ditches. And so for every balanced way we can look at something, there's really, there's, there's a lot more wrong ways we can look at them. And so sometimes we, take it too lightly. Sometimes we try to over-spiritualize it. And then the second thing he tells us not to do here is he tells us not to lose heart. Don't lose heart. Don't be overwhelmed when God disciplines you. Now, here's the problem. That's easier said than done, isn't it? Nobody likes suffering. And even if it's supposedly God's grace to sanctify us and correct us and teach us and to strengthen us, it doesn't make it easier not to lose heart. But I believe that our Father understands that. You see, just because his discipline is perfect doesn't mean that his children always respond to that discipline perfectly. And I think there's grace for that. But I also know that God makes us a promise that even when we don't endure discipline the right way, that as his children, he makes sure that we still produce the same fruit. Look at the promise in verse 11. No discipline seems enjoyable at the time, but painful. Yeah? Like we can relate. And no one wants to be disciplined. Nobody wants hardship. Nobody wants pain. Nobody wants that. I mean, let's be honest. In fact, we do, most of us try everything we can do to avoid it. And nobody wants it. We're not masochists as Christians. Like, we don't, we, don't, we don't seek it out. No discipline seems enjoyable at the time, but painful. But later on, however, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. It yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Look at what Isaiah 32 says about the peaceful fruit of righteousness. I love this, verse 17 of Isaiah 32. It says the result or the fruit of righteousness will be what? It's what we want in those times, isn't it? That's what we probably pay a lot of money for or give up a lot for during those times where we're struggling and we have hardship and pain and sickness and disease is peace. And it says the result of righteousness will be peace. The effect of righteousness will be a quiet confidence forever. The Hebrew word for peace there is the word shalom. And that word shalom is almost always translated as peace, but it, makes, it means so much more than just a peaceful feeling. Shalom is this idea of wholeness to life. And so what it's saying is, is that God will, in our discipline, pick up the pieces of our life and make us whole again. This is the result, that he is gonna take our brokenness 
And he's gonna make us who he wants us to be. That's why verse 12 says this, therefore strengthen your tired hands and weakened knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be dislocated, but what? Healed instead. That, so that God will take up the pieces of your brokenness and make you whole again. But here's the problem. What this passage is saying is that the only way that that is accomplished in you is through discipline. That it can't happen any other way. You see, it doesn't come through running from our issues or wishing our pain away or resisting the hard things in life. It comes from accepting those sufferings as discipline and saying, God, what do you want me to learn from them? What do you want to produce in me? What do you want to do through me? This is painful, but I don't want to waste it. I want it to be used for something good. So God, what are you doing in me? You see, hardships will do one of two things in us. They will focus us or they will distract us. Sometimes we, listen, I'm I'm a warrior. Oh God, I get worried about everything. And I get so distracted from what God really wants to teach me and do in my life because I'm trying to avoid pain. And so we can allow it to distract us or we can allow it to focus us which ultimately brings us around full circle because what is the first thing that we said this morning that we are called to do? We are called to look at Jesus. We are called to focus on Jesus. And it's amazing that the writer of Hebrews tells us not to lose heart, just like Jesus did. Look at what Jesus says in John chapter 16. He says, I have said these things to you that in me you may have what? So you can have peace, so that you can have shalom. In a world where you will have tribulation, You will have pain, but take heart because I've overcome the world. I've already overcome it all. And you're not gonna feel the wrath for your sin. You're not gonna feel the wrath for the sin of the things of this world. You may temporarily be taught some things in this world, but ultimately Jesus has taken the wrath of God for our sin. Because think about it this way. If God disciplines us as sons and daughters, then all punishment that we go through pales in comparison to the suffering that Jesus went through in order to make us sons and daughters. And so when it comes to suffering, we need to have a perception change. We need to change our perspective. Who in here would be honest? We're the church. Listen, if we can't be honest in here, we can't be honest anywhere, yeah? And people around you that love you. Who in here would say you're going through something, you're, you're struggling, you're going through some type of affliction, some type of pain, some type of, maybe it's a relationship issue. What, you're going through some type of hardship right now. I want you to raise your hand. A lot of people. Let me ask you this. Are you wasting that hardship by allowing it to distract you from what God's doing in your life? Are you asking yourself questions like, what is God teaching me through this right now? Is there a plan to this? Because as believers, this is God's way of refining us, of making us more like him. And so we should never, ever, ever waste it. I'm not trivializing it. I'm not saying that it's not a big deal. I'm not saying that you should ignore it. What I'm saying is, is that in that pain, we need to begin to focus on what God's doing in our life. And as the people around you walk through it with you, we need to be committed to praying for you, committed to loving you. Because sometimes the fog of war, if you will, in your suffering keeps us from really seeing things clearly. And so we need people that love us, that care for us, to pray for us, to walk with us through it, to give us clarity on things when we may not be seeing them clearly. And so here's what I wanna do. Band's gonna come up and play in a minute. We're gonna celebrate baptism day, which is gonna be awesome. We're gonna do that in a minute. But if you were honest today, you say, Blake, I, I'm, I'm going through some, some pain and suffering right now. What I would encourage you to do, what I would encourage the people around you to do, maybe even, is number one, you can come down here. We kind of use this as an altar every morning. We have uh, note cards up here that if you want to write down a prayer request, maybe you can write down what you're struggling with right now. We'd love to know that. We'd love to pray with you. But if you see somebody come up here to pray, that raise their hand, and as you, you may not even know them, but you want to pray for them, just come lay your hands on them and pray for them. You might know somebody, you saw them raise their hand, and you want to go over there and just, just in the seat. It may be awkward. Who cares? 
pray for them. This is what we're called to do as the body of Christ, is to love each other, to pray for each other, because we will experience tribulation. We will experience pain. But we are to keep our eyes focused on Jesus and allow him to do his work in us. All right, let's pray. Lord, we love you. We thank you for your goodness. Father, we know. Father, we know that you're working in our pain. You're working in our suffering, Lord. It it seems like sometimes when we're in the middle of it that you're not there. But we know that as as a goldsmith refines its fire, refines the gold through fire, Lord, that it never takes its eyes off of the gold while it's in the fire. And we know your word describes us as being refined by fire. And we know it's during those times where we feel the heat and we feel the suffering, we feel the pain, we feel like that you've left us, Lord. You've never taken your eyes off of us. And you've not left us. So Lord, I I, I talked to folks after the first service who were going through some indescribable pain right now. And I can only conclude that from that, in, a, in a, a group the size this big, that there are people in this room who are suffering through some pretty tough things. Lord, and the worst thing that we could do in our suffering is to keep it to ourselves. Lord, I pray that we invite people in, allow us to share in that suffering, share in that pain. Lord, to hold one another up, to pray for one another. And I pray that that breaks out in here. Because there are, there, I, I, I truly believe there's a, a group of people in here this morning that more than needing to hear a sermon or sing some songs, they just need to be prayed for. So Holy Spirit, allow that to happen in here right now. We love you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing. I'm sorry when I've just gone through the motions. I'm sorry when I just sang another song. Take me back to where we started. I open up my heart to you. And I'm sorry. When I've come with my agenda, I'm sorry. When I forgot that you're enough. 
Take me back to where we started. I open up my heart to you. I'm caught up in your presence. And I just want to sit here at your feet. I'm caught up in this holy moment. I never want to leave. Oh. For blessings, Jesus, you don't owe me anything more than anything that you can do. I just want you, and I just want you. Nothing else, nothing else, nothing else will do. I just want you, and nothing else, and nothing else, nothing else will do. I just want you, and nothing else. got a hand this morning. Uh, you guys can have a seat quickly. Um, we are, have the privilege of celebrating baptize, uh, baptism with somebody this morning. Uh, baptism is a marker in the life of a believer where we take kind of that first step of obedience. And that's after we have given our life to Jesus, after we said, I want to follow Christ. Um, we, we take part in believer, what we call believer's baptism. And, and uh, there's lots of symbolism to that, of the washing of our sins away. Um, there are lots of ceremonial washings in the Bible, and this is kind of our version of that, um, the, uh, the, uh, being buried with Christ in baptism and coming up to new life. So there's lots of symbolism in baptism, but it's really just a, a believer saying, I'm part of the family, and I'm, I'm here. I'm, I'm, I'm with you. I'm, I'm with the church. And so... Um, Wyatt's coming to do that day. Wyatt, come on up. This is Wyatt Cope. Push this up. All right, have a seat, bud. Wyatt um, actually lives close to my neighborhood. Him and my son are, are friends and um, has started coming here. And uh, 
got to talk with Wyatt, I guess about a week ago, about his journey and what God's been teaching him. And um, he's finally come to the point where he's ready to, to make this decision and, and uh, take this step of obedience. So Wyatt, do you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is your Lord and Savior? Yes. Then I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen, amen. All right, listen, love you guys. Hope you have a great, great week. Bring somebody with you next week. We're doing this again next week too, so come on. Love you guys. Have a good one. Words cannot contain the fullness of your